Ahmadi Wana Soldi I was awake at. So you know, after um, Mukti Saab's uh, talk, I don't think this is going to be any spiritual part to this, but I'll try to some, mix something in there. So my name is Imran Adam Naiman. I'm one of the transplant nephrologists at the uh, Forward Transplant Institute in Singapore. Um, I did my uh, training in Michigan, uh, in Washu in St. Louis, and subsequently did my our faculty at University of Michigan, and now I've been here for approximately five years and living in the Valley Island community. So basically, the, they asked me to come and talk about chronic kidney disease. So I'm going to just give you a brief synopsis of chronic kidney disease. This talk, this lecture, or this is not a lecture, this is more of an interactive session from my standpoint. So if you guys get um, you know, confused in the middle or get, you know, think that I'm talking too fast or if you feel that you mis don't understand things, please feel free to interrupt me and we'll have, um, we will have a, um, you know, um, I will repeat that and then make sure you understand things better. So basically my goal is to have you guys understand the basic, path basic pathophysiology or basic ways the kidneys work and what does it mean to have chronic kidney disease and when you have chronic kidney disease, how does it progress? And what is the what is what are what, what is renal replacement therapy? Okay. So a basic uh, thing that I want to talk about is everybody has two kidneys. Your kidneys are size of your fist. So everybody makes a fist. So if you make a fist, this is the size of your kidney. They're all the way in the back, um, behind your word, um, you know, close to your vertebra. So if you remember from science back in the day, you have cervical, you have thoracic, and then you have lumbar vertebra. So it says over here that. You have two kidneys, and usually between the T12, um, T11 to L3 vertebra, that's where your kidneys are. And you have two of them. One is slightly higher, one is slightly lower. They're not on the same plane, okay? As you can see in the picture, the bean-shaped organs in the picture, um, right here, these are the kidneys. These are the adrenal glands, okay? Uh, and this is the ureter that's coming down. So blood goes in through the red, is the aorta, goes to the kidney, and the kidney cleans it, leaves the clean blood, and goes back up there. And the urine that's formed is full of excretory matter, meaning all the toxins and everything else, comes in the ureter, and it's a bladder, and then below your, your urinate front, okay? So it's all the way in the back, okay? So in the front, you have the abdominal wall, then you have all the other organs, and then you have at the back all the way, you have the kidneys. The kidney is very well protected by the ribs in the back and all the organs in the front. And what we call retroperitoneum, meaning there's a layer of a membrane that's kind of protecting and it stays there. So it doesn't move around that much, okay? Any questions about that so far? Okay. So feel free to interrupt me, and I just, this is not a lecture, this is a more of a conversation, okay? So what is the function of the kidney, okay? Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Okay. So the function of the kidney is basically, you know, I always tell my patients, you know, the four things, okay? Uh, first thing is to maintain blood pressure, uh, so electrolytes, um, so maintain blood pressure meaning salt, maintain the small humus basis. And the second is to maintain electrolytes. Third is to produce hormone to produce red blood cells. And uh, sorry, fourth is to maintain um, um, calcium phosphorus metabolism. So let me recap, recap. So first thing is to maintain blood pressure and volume status, meaning it maintains whether your blood pressure is going to be high or low, okay? That's kidney's job. If it's low, it's going to make it high. If it's high, it's going to try to bring it down, okay? And there's a different mechanism of doing that. Second, it maintains electrolytes. So what are the electrolytes common in the blood blood? You have sodium, you have potassium, you have bicarb, you have calcium, you have phosphorus. So it maintains the balance. So it has to be a certain level. So for example, if calcium is too high, it's going to pee it out, okay? If the calcium is too low, it's going to conserve the calcium. Same thing with the phosphorus, okay? Same thing with the sodium, potassium, to maintain the homeostasis. So the homeostasis meaning yes, a balance of these things. It produces a hormone called erythropoietin. So it produces a, the hormone is produced by the kidney, goes to the bone marrow, stimulates the bone marrow to put out red blood cells. Okay. Last but not least, it maintains it maintains um, calcium, phosphorus, and bone metabolism. So how does it do that? By producing a hormone which is vitamin, which is called a vitamin D. Now you take vitamin D from your food, it goes to your liver, then eventually goes to your kidney and becomes what we call active vitamin D. And that's what maintains your calcium balance in your body and helps the bone become stronger. Okay? Is everybody with me? Okay, good. Alhamdulillah. Okay. So the next part we talk, talk about, so now I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a brief idea of what internally the organ looks like. Okay? So there's two different pictures here. Okay? So forget about this one right now. So if you make a cross section of the kidney, you have this again, this is the artery, this is the vein. The blood goes in, 
It goes to the meat of the kidney. This is the part where the ureter is attached. This is where the urine comes from, come out from. So in there, the, the blood, dirty blood goes in there to the artery, gets cleaned, and then the clean blood goes to the vein and goes to your body again. Okay? Now, if you look at this part in the kidney, if you look at the microscope, they have individual units that's part of the kidney. So each, build, each, each organ of the body has building blocks. So this part is the kidney building block. It's called nephron. That's the word nephrology comes from. Study of nephron, right? And nephrologist, the, the, supposed to be the expert of the nephron, okay? So there are different parts of this. So basically, this is under the microscope. This is, there are pr approximately a million micro, uh, nephron in each kidney, okay? So this is the, the blood again, same blood goes in through this part. It filters and goes to different parts of this tube. It eventually it comes over here and goes and you essentially pee out the the matter that's not, the toxins and everything else, okay? So, the, so there are multi-million units in there. All these tubes over here, which are called the collecting tubule, they already connect to over here in this section, and eventually you just, urine comes out, okay? Everybody with me? So we talked about two kidneys, um, back here, okay? Then there's, um, blood goes in, cleans up, blood comes out. The ultrastructural unit, the main functioning part of the kidney is called the nephron. Now we are talking about the, 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 the part of the kidney, the previous slide. The small part over here, this part, is called the glomerulus. Now, if you, if this is kind of important to kind of remember, okay? I'll tell you why that is in a minute. So if you look at the nephron, so uh, look at the glomerulus. So what's happening over here is, forget this picture right now, you pay attention over here. This is the artery that's bringing out the blood. It's making a kind of a net of small, really small arteries and surrounded by a space in which the urine comes out from. So you have um, bad blood coming over here and all the good part of the blood, the red blood cells, the protein, the white cells, all the good things that you need stays back and all the bad stuff comes over here, okay? And then you go through, through the system, same thing over here. The good, the, the, the uh, uh, all the capillaries, the, the net, and all the bad stuff comes down here, and, and then eventually you essentially pee it out, okay? It's a little more complicated than that, but this is a simplistic explanation, okay? Okay, so now there's a basic concept, this is a basic thing I wanna gonna make you understand. So you hear, whenever you go to a doctor's office, they look at your kidney function numbers, and there's a number in there, some of the, people have probably paid attention to that, it's called GFR, and that helps you determine what stage of kidney disease you're at. So what is GFR? And that's what I'm trying to explain. So GFR basically is a test essentially that determines how much your kidney function is, okay? So GFR is glomerular fil filtration rate. So go back to the slide again. This, this slide over here shows that whatever is filtered amount comes over here, that's the filtration rate. That's what they're determining, okay? Back in the day when people were doing research, they actually calculated their true GFR by doing tubular studies, like microscopic tubular studies and the micropipettes. They, they did a lot of studies and basic science studies to determine what the GFR is. Now, we cannot do it in everybody. So we use age, uh, uh, sex, um, their kidney function, and different other parameters and put in a formula and then determine their GFR, okay? It has these, these formulas have been validated multiple times. So, this, so now it's kind of becoming a standard of care, okay? So essentially, GFR is in a nutshell, calculating what your kidney function is like. Okay. All right, so here's the um, GFR that I, uh, GFR for a normal individual. So it's, it, it, is, it varies from age to age. I'm, I'm gonna explain to you in a few minutes why it varies from age to age. So if you see, for a 20 or 29 year old individual, the mean GFR for a male is approximately 21, 28. And as you age, see after 40 years, people say you go downhill, it's true. Your GFR decreases over time because you're getting older, okay? So this is a standard deviation. Does anybody understand, people understand standard deviation? So whenever you do any study, you have a population of like, let's say 100 people. So you, you will not always get a average number. The average is, this is the mean, okay? Standard deviation is how much is spread. So the greater the spread is, the more variable the data is and you don't rely on that. But anyways, just don't pay attention to that, pay attention to this one. This is the mean GFR for anybody who is, uh, who has, chronic kidney, who has a normal kidney function at different ages, okay? 
Again, back to our glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, tells us what your kidney function is like, okay? Women, same thing, they have a lower GFR than men, but over time it decreases as well, okay? Any questions so far about this? Okay, so don't move on. Okay, so now I want to talk about what, what, what GFR exactly means, you know? So you have the GFR normal for individuals is 120, okay? 120 ml per minute. What does that mean? That the, the body, the kidney, kidney overall, processes 120 ml of blood per minute, okay? And then it, for 60 minutes, it processes 7,200 ml of blood. In 24 hours, it processes 172,000 ml, which means 172 liters a day of blood is being processed by the kidney. SubhanAllah. You know, the constantly bodies, that's why I created a system that cleans the body consistently. That's why people who have chronic kidney disease, they really know what, how they feel because the kidney is not doing a good job cleaning their blood. Because it just has to process this much blood to keep your body clean, okay? And no machine has been uh, discovered or made so far that can do the same job, so far. Okay. So now, what is chronic kidney disease, okay? So I'm just gonna read off a slide. So chronic kidney disease is this slow, progressive loss of kidney function, that means decreasing GFR, okay, over a period of several months to a year, okay? And so what happens is if you cannot get rid of all the stuff, then you will have retention of waste in the body and have health problems associated with retention of those waste, waste products, okay? And so what's a distinct, uh, what, is, what distinguishes chronic kidney disease and acute kidney injury? So acute kidney injury meaning your kidney damage occurred right now, today, yesterday, or day before yesterday. You can recover from that potentially. Chronic kidney disease, once you have it, you can't recover from it. It's like if somebody is 40 and he comes and asks me, can, I, can you make me 35 again? Can't do it, right? It's not possible. Same thing with, once you have chronic kidney disease established, you can't fix it. So what can we do about it? What we can do about it is basically maintain that for a while, um, deal with the consequences of the chronic kidney disease, and avoid anything that can damage the kidney more, okay? So again, acute kidney injury, fixable, chronic kidney disease, not fixable, but you can potentially maintain it, okay? Any questions so far? Okay. So what are the causes of chronic kidney disease? The list is huge. I just wanna kinda focus on the major ones, okay? So major causes of chronic kidney disease is hypertension, high blood pressure, or diabetes. These are two major causes. As you can see, you have the pie graph there. So I have diabetes up here, and the hypertension is uh, right here, okay? The rest of it are different kidney diseases that are inherited in the disease. So you have hypertension, you have diabetes, then you have vascular disease, meaning all, body, or all of our body has vascular vessels. So if you have peripheral vascular disease, if you have uh, cholesterol deposition in the kidney tubes, you have vascular disease that can damage the kidney as well. Then you have lupus-like diseases, autoimmune disorders, uh, you can have inheritable diseases from the family that you can get it from, like a polycystic kidney disease, and other autoimmune disorders that can damage the kidney, okay? But the most common one is diabetes and hypertension. That's what I see most of the time, okay? So <clears throat> back in the day, when we were learning about chronic kidney disease, people decided this is, that we should, we, we should stage them. And the purpose of the stages is primarily for research purposes, epidemiological purposes, not primarily management purposes. So if somebody has chronic kidney disease stage one and stage two, it doesn't really matter. Like, it doesn't really matter to me, right? They, they come and see me, everything's fine, kidney disease is mildly abnormal, okay, we'll just keep an eye on it. But management, but, but epidemiology, to, to, to determine how, what's the prevalence or how much chronic kidney disease in the community, people decide that we need to have some kind of guideline to determine how many people have that. Why? Because if you have somebody has chronic kidney disease stage two, as time goes along, they're gonna have, they'll have stage three, then a stage four, and then a stage five, right? So if you know how many people are stage two, as, as a public health person, you will, you have to determine how much resources you have to put in the community, like how many hospitals should be built over here and things like that. So that's one of the factors that we use to determine that. For my, as a nephrologist, I usually see patients from three onward. One and two usually very rare, okay? Primary care physician can handle that. Why? Because all these abnormalities and complications, like as I mentioned to you, kidney does the, produces erythropoietin to produce red blood cells. Uh, kidney maintains calcium phosphorus metabolism. It maintains salt. 
um, uh, maintains salt balance, maintains potassium balance and other balances. So that problem do not occur before you cross this line, okay? So usually when I, when I see my, my, in my practice as a nephrologist, I see patients who have secondary complications of chronic kidney disease. These diseases, these, these parts are basically primarily for epidemiological purposes. The primary care physician would say, okay, your kidney function is mildly reduced, it's not getting worse, it's stable, you don't have any of these complications, so you don't need to see a nephrologist, you see, I will see you, and if it gets worse, you should see a nephrologist, because now they have to do things that are in addition to my scope expertise, okay? So again, stage one is essentially, you know, your GFR, again, it's based on GFR. Greater than 90 is stage one with kidney damage. Stage two with mild reduce function is 60 or 89. Anything less than 60, you start having problems. Now this section is the most troublesome. If your kidney function is less than 15, you cannot maintain uh, you know, good function, you have multiple secondary complications, and you cannot get rid of all the toxins. Then you have to go what we call towards renal replacement therapy. And we're gonna talk about it in a minute, okay? Any questions? So remember I earlier in the slide, I mentioned you know, estimated GFR for different ages, and you saw that there was this natural decline in kidney function as you age. So anybody who has no medical problems at all, as they age, our body, our heart, our lung, our brain, our body overall ages too as well. So the kidney ages too. So the kidney function declines as you age. So you can see over time, in your 20s, your GFR is elevated. And then after that, slow decline. And by the time you lose, by the time you're close to 80 or 90 years of age, you only lost 30 to 40% of your kidney function. This is without any other medical issues. You all know that as you age, people develop hypertension, they get surgeries, they get hospitalized for different things, so their kidney function declines more than this normally. And if they develop you know, hypertension, their kidney function can decline, and before they know it, by 60, 65, 80, 70 years of age, their kidneys kinda are stage five, they need dialysis, okay? And if you're diabetic, it's faster even. This is another graph, even though you don't have to memorize this, it's just to determine how fast your kidney disease is gonna progress. So uh, again, don't have to remember it. This, on this side is, is GFR stages, and this side if you have protein in the urine. Again, remember from the glomerulus uh, picture that I showed you, all the good stuff has to stay back, all the bad stuff comes out. The good stuff is blood cells, protein, um, you know, um, platelets, but if your urine is putting out protein, it means you have kidney damage. Okay, so the higher the number of protein, the more the kidney damage. So this graph is highlighting if your kidney function is declined, so that for example, you're stage five, let's say, let's talk about stage three, and you have this much protein, protein in the urine, your chances of going on dialysis is significantly higher this red bar. If you're green, you're okay. If you're all the way over here, you're probably gonna be on dialysis soon. That's what just, you know, there has been population studies that have been done, and that's what they tell us. So we look at this, if somebody comes to me in clinic, and has severely depressed renal function, has significant proteinuria, I have to see him more frequently because I know one of these days the kidney is gonna shut down and he will need to go on dialysis, okay? Now this, this, this for diabetics, I wanna highlight this specifically. Um, so, you, as you, so this graph shows GFR and hyperglycemia year, meaning how long has been they've been diabetic. So this is one time of diagnosis and this is 27 months. Uh, sorry, 27 years, okay? So if somebody has diabetic has been diagnosed and did not develop any kidney problem for approximately nine, maybe 12, 10, 12 years, okay? Um, so this is, um, sorry, this is the GFR part. This is the protein part, okay? Once you develop kidney damage, you start losing protein. And after they lose protein, if the protein level goes up this high, they're usually on dialysis by that time. So what that means is if you have protein in the urine and you're diabetic, you should be worried. Why? Because if the protein is not controlled, your diabetes is gonna progress really fast, and then the way it goes is these goes up, and all of a sudden you just decline really fast. So you can see this decline, because even though it looks like it's a 15 to 27 years, but if you are really have proteinuria, you only have, you, you, within a few years, you'll decline faster. Like at 24, you were, you had some proteinuria, and then you decline all of a sudden, okay? So diabetics is extremely important to control your diabetes and control your protein in the urine. So your doctor will explain to you how to control the diabetes and how to control the protein. 
Now, once you have chronic kidney disease, as I mentioned, you have to remember four things. I'm going to expand it a little bit over here. So if you have chronic kidney disease, you will have a problem with salt and water balance. You may have a problem with potassium balance. You may have a problem with getting rid of all the toxins. You have a problem with producing the erythropoietin hormone that I mentioned to you about. You may have a problem with acid-base balance. You may have a problem with the vitamin D balance. And you may have a problem with the potassium phosphorus. So once you have chronic kidney disease, especially when you're stage three, remember stage one and two is not a big deal, stage three, as a nephrologist, I have to look at all these different things and make sure that everything is managed properly, okay? So for example, if you have a salt and water balance problem, you will have hypertension. You may have edema. You may have too much swelling in your body and end up resulting in heart failure. If you have potassium problem, potassium can go up significantly because you cannot get rid of it because your kidneys don't work. You can have elect you, can, you may have arrhythmias and things like that. If you have problem with nitrogen or all the all the waste products, like our body metabolizes all the food products, you cannot get rid of it. You will be have you will develop something called uremia or too much oxygen living in your body, and then have problems, multitudes of problems. You may have, you know, behavioral problems, to sleep problems, to heart problems, and all these things. So I have to monitor all these things as a nephrologist to make sure that this is controlled. If it's uncontrolled, I cannot manage it medically. Then you go on dialysis. Okay. Then the same thing with erythropoietin production. If you don't produce enough EPO, your hemoglobin is low. I have to give him your exogenous EPO to, to make sure your hemoglobin keeps back up. Same thing with vitamin D balance and phosphate metabolism as well. Okay. This is the slide which tells you the blood pressure issues. So over time, you know, if your blood pressure is 160 or high, your decline in kidney function will be quick. If your blood pressure is 165. 165 or less is controlled, your decline of kidney function is going to be less. This is the years from beginning end stage therapy, okay? So if you have higher blood pressure, you'll quickly go on dialysis, meaning your kidney is going to quickly. If you control your blood pressure less than 165, you, 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 so basically the lower the blood pressure, the better it is for long term for kidney survival. <clears throat> so how do you treat chronic kidney disease? So basically, again, treat underlying cause. If you have diabetes, control your diabetes. If you have hypertension, control your hypertension. <clears throat> um, and try to control blood pressure variability. So you don't, you want to, don't want your blood pressure to be too low, you don't want it to be too high. You have to maintain in a happy medium, which is like 120 over 80, that's it. Okay? And then treat, uh, further damage, prevent further damage. So for example, non steroidal anti-inflammatory medications like ibuprofen, Aleve, Advil, these medications, aspirin, high doses, are bad for the kidneys. So you should not be taking those medications if you have chronic kidney disease. You can take it once in a while, but you cannot take it chronically. Like some people take Tylenol PM at night, or some people take <coughs> Advil PM at night to go to sleep. They're not a good idea. Long term, it's going to damage the kidneys. <coughs> I think secondary complication we kind of talked about. <coughs> Management-wise, I think we talked about a little bit. So again, if you're anemic, I have to give you the medications to bring your anemia, hemoglobin up. If you have phosphorus levels elevated, I have to give you binders that you eat with food that binds the phosphorus so your phosphorus doesn't go up. If you have metabolic acidosis, meaning you have too much acid in your body, I have to give you an alkali to fix that. <clears throat> if you have um, high potassium, I have to decrease your diet in potassium. I have to educate you about low potassium diet. No oranges, no bananas, or anything, <clears throat> or anything that has high potassium. Sodium retention, you have too much fluid, fluid buildup in your body, swelling in your legs, sh shortness of breath, and things like that. I have to give you diuretic to make you pee so you can get rid of all the, all the toxins, all the water that way. <clears throat> so once chronic kidney disease advances to stage five chronic kidney disease, meaning you cannot, I, and I cannot manage it medically, meaning I cannot give you diuretics to get rid of the fluid. I cannot give you enough erythropoietin to bring your hemoglobin up. Or I cannot give you enough acid, acid uh, suppressant therapy. And really you come to a point that you need to go on dialysis or we call it renal replacement therapy. So renal replacement therapy basically means that I have to replace the kidney function with something. So either you can go on dialysis or either you get a kidney transplant. Okay? If you go on dialysis, you have two options. Either you go on hemodialysis through the blood or peritoneal dialysis, which the next slide will explain to you. So as you can see on the right side, this is a hemodialysis machine that's attached to a, a patient is attached to it. So we create something in their arm. The blood goes from the patient all the way to the machine, and this is the filter. It fills the blood out and goes back in. Okay? How much, how much kidney function do you provide for this machine? Can anybody guess? So let's say we have a GFR of 100 normal. How much GFR do you think I will provide with this machine? I'm sorry? No, 15%. 
And we do it three times a week. So ba this is basically barely keeping the patient alive. This is not the way to live, okay? So that's why we, most of nephrologists, we push our patients to get a kidney transplant because we cannot do dialysis. Because remember, our kidneys are working 24 seven. This machine is working three hours, three times a week. How can you provide the same level of function? It's impossible, right? Otherwise, you're, either you're hooked up to a machine 24 seven, and that's not impossible to do, right? Now, at least with the technology we have right now. So you can't provide that function. The other option is called peritoneal dialysis, in which we use the belly, put the fluid in the belly, and the belly has, uh, uh, the, the fluid we put in doesn't have any toxins in there, it pulls the toxins from the blood, but again, it doesn't do a good job, as a good job as the kidneys do, just barely make you stay alive for a few years, essentially. But somebody on dialysis, if they're healthy enough, they should go for a kidney transplant. Okay? <clears throat> so kidney transplant, is essentially, you transplant an organ from a healthy person to a person who has chronic kidney disease. So basically, we take the kidney of a donor, this kidney out, and implant it here. We don't implant it where it was. We implant it here in the, in the lower um, part because we want to make sure that we can access that for any problem that can occur. We put it at the back, there's a very secure place. It's a big operation, nobody wants to do it. It's more complication. So we put it over here, and then the kidney transplant, and once you have a kidney transplant, you can potentially live a, probably a normal life if everything goes well, okay? So now something cutting edge. So, so what, what's, what's the future of, um, you know, because of the fact that dialysis, a lot of patients that are on dialysis, wait times in, in Texas, approximately two to three years, up to five years in certain centers, so organs are not available because, you know, we, they, you know we, somebody, has, somebody has to donate the kidney, we don't have that many health, healthy donors, people are scared to donate, and then we don't have any cadaveric donor that much available, so people are waiting on the list and dying on the list. So we need to have something about some other alternatives. So, there has been a push for artificial kidneys for a very long time. So currently, this is the artificial kidney model here, something heavy that you walk around with, but it's not very convenient, right? It's very difficult to walk around. Somebody has a, you know, essentially walking in the machine. But now there's a, I think the phase two trial going on, which in which, uh, can everybody see this? Okay, so basically, this is a really small machine that's implantable. You implant in the, belt, in the, in the abdomen, and this part uh, goes in the vein and the artery, and this small part essentially is the kidney. So artificial kidney, and using, it's using nanotechnology to clean the blood and eventually it makes urine too as well. So you can potentially have normal physiology, meaning you're urinating normally and, you're, and you don't have to deal with the immunosuppression medicine that you have to do with kidney transplant. It's still not available, widely available. UCSF is the only center that's doing the, uh, the trials right now. But it's promising by 2020, I think I'm probably gonna lose my job. So this was coming, okay? Any questions so far? So, you know, my goal was to just give you a brief synopsis. I hope I didn't overwhelm you guys and give you more than you expected. More than you expected. So, um, I'm here to answer any questions. I'm sorry, I can hear you. Um, like uh, anything, um, uh, you know, it's simple things, you know. Eat healthy, diet, exercise. That's pretty much just to keep healthy. You know, like any organ in the body, like our kidney has a vascular system too as well. So anything good for the heart is good for the kidney. So stay active, eat healthy, avoid de developing diabetes. Um, you know, keep yourself hydrated. That's pretty much it. No, what drinking excess amount of water is never going to help you. No, because uh, water does not help the kidney. The only time it helps the kidney if you're dehydrated. If you don't have enough, wa enough water in your body, then obviously it would be a problem. But drinking more water than normal, no, it's not necessary. If you have kidney stone, that's a separate story. Then you have to drink more water because your body is telling you you're dehydrated. Because kidney stone doesn't occur in individuals who's, who are adequately hydrated, unless you have underlying problem. If you have underlying problem with kidney stone, then obviously you need to treat the underlying problem and then lots of water to prevent kidney stone. Like your kidney, you're, you're, uh, when you, uh, if, if you have developing kidney stone and you don't have an underlying reason to develop kidney stone, it's because you're not drinking enough water. But normally, uh, nobody should be um, uh, drinking a lot of water. So let me explain it a little better. Okay, so no, um, how, much, uh, how much water does the kidney need to get rid of all the toxins in the body? Do you have a rough idea? Okay, so... Hmm? 
uh, half a liter, okay, 600 mLs. So for a 70 kilogram average individual, you need 600 mLs of water to get rid of all the toxins, okay? How much water do you lose from your skin? Anyone know? Yeah. Skin, breathing, uh, sweating, in an ambient temperature, okay, let me just give you that. Okay. Roughly a liter, correct. So on average, in order to maintain homeostasis in an ambient temperature, you need to drink only a liter and a half, maybe maximum two liters. Okay. Now, where does the water come from in your body, in your, in your nutrition? You get water from just plain water, okay? But what about soups? You get water from that, okay? What about bread? It metabolizes in carbon dioxide and water. You get water from that. Salads have water. Fruit has water. So you don't have to drink two liters of water. You can get water in your food too, okay? But that's an ambient temperature. Obviously, if you're a marathon runner, if you go outside in the hot sun in Texas heat, obviously you're drinking more. You know, you're drinking probably three or four liters. And the best way to judge that, if you're thirsty, that's too late. Okay? So you have to gauge your body, how, how your body is working. If you're thirsty, that's too late. You have to drink water before that. Okay? The other thing to judge is go, when you go to the bathroom to urinate, if urine has a color, you're dehydrated. It should not be yellow. Like, at least dark yellow. If it's dark yellow, then, you know, it's a problem. If it's red, call the doctor right away. Okay? Uh, chronic kidney disease, um, you know, it's like diabetes, hypertension. You look back a little bit. So chronic kidney is a result of something else. It's not, it doesn't happen by itself, okay? So either you have hypertension and diabetes. We know hypertension is genetic. We also know diabetes is genetic. We also know nephronathesis, lupus, and all these things. So yes, it's genetic. But again, chronic kidney disease is not a disease by itself. It's, it's, a, it's, a after, it's an effect of something else. We, we, we call it a disease because the, the manifestations, the secondary manifestation is what we need to manage. So those are the things that we have to kind of pay attention to. So that's why we just lump it in one disease, that's why, you know, just to make it easy. Good question. So, um, so uh, cost of kidney transplant is, I mean, I, if somebody doesn't have insurance, it's upward, upward to, um, the initial admission is upward to 100000 to $220,000. If you, don't, if you don't have insurance. The maintenance medications for kidney transplant per month on average will be $2,000 per month maintenance for the rest of your life, okay? So if somebody doesn't have insurance and does not have, you know, healthcare coverage, their cost is gonna be that much. Um, the average expense of dialysis per year is approximately uh, $100,000 or so per year. So if you don't have insurance, um, you may not, you will not get dialysis. But if you, if you get dialysis in the United States and you're a citizen, you automatically get Medicare, so dialysis is covered, and then you're gonna get a kidney transplant too as well, because now you have Medicare now. So it, the cost is not gonna be there. But for non-citizens, no, there's not an option. Oh, yeah, sorry for the, yeah, success rate, so basically success, the way we look at success rate is what we call grass survival. Grass survival basically means you get a kidney transplant, how many kidney transplants actually last. And so average grass survival, depends on the center you go to, is between 90 to 100 percent first year. Uh, up, uh, third, third, three year grass survival is approximately 85 percent. So 85 patients who get a transplant by three years they will keep their kidney. It's getting better as time goes along because we we learn it. We didn't know much about transplant before. Now we learn and now we know more. So now I expect if somebody gets a kidney transplant today and if it do well, luck, Allah uh, mercy, luck, um, you know, um, you know, good doctors, good healthcare providers everything, and they do a good job taking care of themselves, can last up to 20 years. It depends on the center. You know, some centers have a wait time. So average wait time in Dallas, Fort Worth area, so Dallas is a different center, different OPO, what we call, has five years, Fort Worth is two to three years. California is 10, New York is 10, uh, in North Michigan is five, Ohio is three, every, every state is different. Yes, if they are candidates, correct. Uh -huh. Oh, nowadays because of the uh, because we are we are more watch watchful of that. It's calculated by the by itself, yeah. And the physical, all the lab tests have been done. GFR should be there.
GFR is the basically the only way you can find determine if you have kidney disease, chronic age. It totally depends on how good, that's, again, that's a good question. It's, it's individual specific. So for example, if you are on top of things, you watch your diet, you control your blood pressures. Um, you know, there are patients who can not, may not move. I have a patient who had a creatinine of two, which means that their GFR was 40. They're, they're stage four chronic kidney disease. They lasted five, 10 years on four. But there are patients who are stage three and they're on dialysis next year. So it depends on the individual how good they are in terms of, in terms of taking, in, uh, taking care of themselves. Yeah, so we, this is one of the things we use to calculate the GFR. So, so basically age, sex, creatinine, um, and all these different things we lose, use to determine what, if somebody has chronic kidney disease or not. Chief? I'm, I'm sorry, I just... The left, I think. I'm sorry? Uh -huh. So, you know, Marshall, um, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the body in such a way that it, the body can compensate. So if you, one kidney is gone, you can survive on one kidney and live a normal life. Because, uh, you know, when you're younger, now obviously when you're older it's different. When you're younger, all of our organs have reserves. So for example, if you, let's see a 10 year old, will be running over there outside without any problems. And you and I, if we have to run with them, we can't make it because we are older and our reserves are going down, right? So the younger you are, you have more reserves. Same thing with the kidneys. You, you have two kidneys, the ex, one extra is basically a reserve just in case you have a problem. Yes? Yeah, so th the reason for uh, presenting this topic is unfortunately chronic kidney disease, the symptoms occur very late. So by the time you have symptoms, it's late. So it's stage four and it's stage five, usually you have symptoms. Up to stage three, you will not have any symptoms at all. That's why when you go to the doctor, that's why they do blood tests. So if you go for a child, you, uh, if you remember anybody who has kids, at age 10, uh, sorry, after age, I think after age 10, they start checking their blood pressure and the urine test. No, they start earlier. Because the kidney disease in kids some of sometimes occur early. So they are looking for that stuff early on, even though the kids have no symptoms. So same thing with you, an adult, adult male should see a doctor at least once a year or once every couple of years. And the basic test they need to get done is blood pressure check, kidney function check, cholesterol check. Because by the time you have symptoms, it's too late. Now, what symptoms to worry about? Obviously fatigue, swelling in the leg, um, urine, more frothy urine and things like that. Those are <coughs> frothy urine is probably a signs of chronic of, of kidney disease. Did it uh, answer your follow up? Go ahead. You have a follow up question? Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so I, uh, this, is, uh, this is my field, so I'm, I'm a transplant nephrologist, so I deal with it regularly. So, so the question is, do you need to be compatible? Okay, so c compatibility basically means at different levels. So one is the ABO and compatibility, your blood type compatibility. Second, compatibility is on different antigen levels, okay? Do you have to be compatible now? Uh, yes, if you wanna give the kidney to the same person. No, if you wanna go and exchange. So now we have exchanges available, so for example, your relative wants to get a kidney and you want to donate the kidney to the relative. You guys are not a match on a blood type or not a match on other things, okay? Not a match on other things doesn't really matter anymore. So blood type of match is a problem, okay? So what we say, okay, we'll put you in exchange. Your kidney is gonna to go to that recipient who needs a kidney and that person's donor is kidney is gonna to come to your donor and we can do an exchange. So compatibility is kind of out in terms of getting a kidney transplant. Okay, now about what are the long-term problems for donors? 
So recipient, the kidney survival, uh, graft survival, meaning is approximately 10 to 15, up to 20 years. For donors, there's no, there's no evidence at this current time that says conclusively that it's, it's unsafe. So the, co the consensus is, is it's safe. How do we know it's safe? Because somebody looked at donors and followed them longitudinally, meaning over time, and 20 to 15 years down the road, they had hypertension, 40% of them, and had protein in the urine. But compared to normal population, there was no difference, which means that regardless of donation, as you get older, you will develop hypertension because everybody gets old and develop hypertension. It's pretty normal. When you get 60, a majority of the 40% of the population is going to be hypertensive anyways. So whether you donated the kidney or didn't donate the kidney, it doesn't really matter. Okay. There is some data from Europe that's coming out that suggests that there's a 40% increase 40% increased risk of developing uh, cardiovascular events in the future, which means you are at 40% increased risk of having a heart attack or a stroke if you are a donor. Now, but this is a retrospective analysis, which means they look at a chart right now and look back on all those donors and see what have happened with them, okay? So it's not a good study. So we need to do longitudinal study to see for sure. And the other thing, they do not control for other factors. For example, if you are a donor, you're healthy right now. Well, tomorrow you start smoking or tomorrow you gain 50 pounds and you become a diabetic. Well, you have 10 kidneys, it doesn't really matter. Your kidney's gonna fail, right? If you're gonna, add, uh, you're gonna have an unhealthy habit long term, I cannot control that, right? So if you stay healthy, most likely you're not gonna have a problem. I'm sorry, I missed it. No, no, it's usually from enlarged prostate. If you remember that the ureter kidneys are in the back, they go, the ureter comes along and you have bladder. Around the bladder is uh, what we call the prostate gland, and as they get older, the prostate enlarges, and it blocks, and that's why you have, you have symptoms of frequency, urgency, and dribbling. So you, they need to see a urologist and get the prostate checked. It's not, it's, it's not from the chronic kidney disease. Chronic kidney disease does not have symptoms. That's the bad part about the disease. Like same thing with hypertension, nobody has symptoms 190 blood pressure, sure, you might have symptoms. But 160, you will not have symptoms. You will not have no symptoms at all. And by the time you have symptoms of hypertension, it's too late. There's not a whole lot we can do for that. The damage has been done already. You can potentially maintain some level of function and some level of blood pressure control, but the damage has already been done. If you have recurrent, correct, you can have it. Like obstruction, you can cause blockage and the kidney can damage from that. If you have big stones, they can cause damage to the kidney for sure. Yeah. It's not a common cause, I don't see it that much. Back in the day when you were not as vigilant as ki of kidney stones uh, as we are now, uh, that was a big cause. Uh, like when I was in Pakistan and SIUT, a lot of kids would come, stone disease and have you know, ki uh, kidney failure at uh, 10 years of age uh, because of stones. But now I don't see it that much anymore. Like I, I, in my practice, I might have one patient with no, no kidney problems. Like had to have stones and I manage the stone disease. I only have one other case. Yeah. You're welcome.